My question is around tips to gain weight. I'm basically healthy. Yes. Um, and does fasting, because it might reset absorption or something, help with that? And also, are you referring to Himalayan and Celtic sea salts when you say get rid of all salts? Yeah, the only advantage to the quote Himalayan or Celtic sea salts is that they're contaminated with other minerals. So the concentration of the sodium is somewhat less per volume. But it's like saying honey versus sugar. Yeah, honey is twice as sweet per gram of sugar, so you'll eat less of it. But eating less of it doesn't solve the problem that you shouldn't be eating any of it. You get the sodium you need from your diet, your whole plant foods, just like you get the carbohydrate you need. You don't need to add sugar to your diet. You don't need to add oil to your diet. You can get the fats, the, the, uh, sugar, the carbohydrates, and the sodium from the actual whole foods. Okay. okay. And tips to gain weight. For yes. So we don't recommend an eight-hour feeding window in people where they're underweight. Well, first of all, you want to make sure, are you underweight? That's number one. And or are you, are you under lean tissue or, or under fat? So, you know, most people are not... Um, if, if, if trying to gain weight is about putting muscle mass on and additional lean tissue, the way you have to do that is you have to eat more calories than you're burning. So that would mean we've, we've increased to maybe a 12 hour feeding window instead of an eight hour feeding window, just to allow more opportunity to get food in. And we do just the opposite of what we do for most people, where as most people we say, eat brown rice, don't eat rice pasta, uh, eat whole oranges, don't drink orange juice. That is, we may process the food a little bit more if we're trying to gain weight, just to remove some of the fiber, allow people to override their natural limiting satiety response so they can get a little bit more caloric density in. But more importantly, is begin stimulating anabolic growth with uh, exercise. So weight training in particular, or resistance training, doing exercises that cause resistance so you can build muscle mass because you're trying to put muscle on, not put on, just put, store fat. And so... Uh, increased caloric density, increased resistance training, increased sleep and stress management. You know, the, you know, too much stress and the hormonal effects that it have can alter absorption and digestion and peristalsis. You know, think about when animals get stressed, they tend to get uh, increased parasympathetic tone and diarrhea and other problems. So uh, we want to do the things that are going to allow the body to absorb its food better. If you can eat and, uh, and chew your food thoroughly, that stimulates digestive secretions and allows for better absorption. If the food you eat is clean food. And if you have a disrupted microbiome, sometimes believe it or not, fasting can be useful. A short fast, just for the purposes of re uh, correcting the gut microbiome may allow you on the same diet to then be able to start absorbing food and, and gaining weight. For example, our fasting patients have a higher lean mass six weeks after fasting than they did before they started fasting, even though they've lost weight and their fat loss has been substantial. Thanks very much. And up next we have Lois. I'm going to ask you to unmute, see if that'll help us. Hi, Lois. Hi, good morning. Um, Dr. Goldhammer, do you believe that whole food plant-based older individuals need more protein? And if so, what percentage would you recommend? Yes, we recommend that people get somewhere around 10% of their calories from protein. And that's ironically enough about the percentage of calories from protein that come in a whole plant food diet. And particularly if you're willing to include a small quantity of things like nuts or seeds in the diet, we recommend an ounce a day, of things like walnuts or flax seeds. If you're able to eat those without them being food triggers or being problems, it really isn't very difficult getting enough protein in the diet. Um, also, there are some plant-based foods that are particularly rich in protein, like, for example, beans, uh, lentils, peas. These are, you know, a significant percentage of your calories coming from protein. And uh, all plants have protein. Even watermelon has some protein in it. So when all of your calories come from whole foods, getting enough protein really isn't an issue. It's a bigger concern avoiding excess protein. It's excess protein that's really uh, more of a major health risk, and particularly excess animal protein because the high sulfur amino acids associated with animal protein also associated with conditions like osteoporosis and kidney disease and cancer. So we really don't want to be eating uh, those foods. And you don't have to make up for the lack of those foods. You just have to get a whole plant food SOS free diet. Thank you very much for that as well, Dr. Goldhammer. Up next, we're going to bring in Steve. Hi, Steve. Hi. Hi, Dr. Goldhammer. Steve, Hello. how are you doing? Doing great. Uh, 
Steve in his sweatpants because you told me put some clothes on the other day. Um, have a young friend of mine. Uh, she's, I don't know, she's not 40 yet. Uh, severe liver disease on a tr transplant team uh, and too sick to go forward with the transplant. Hmm. Um, how do we deal with, with, with this sort of thing? And another friend that's on dialysis, like how do we deal with these really sick folks? Well, you can't fast the patient on dialysis because they're not going to be able to hold up to fasting. Uh, so when the kidney disease has gotten to the so badly that you're not able to fast, we have to limit it to dietary intervention. And even that has to be carefully manipulated because of you know, even potassium clearance and other things. That's definitely something that would require advice from one of the medical doctors uh, at the Truman Health Center, and they can access those people through telemedicine. That's not something that my general advice is going to be sufficient for. Number of things you have to consider on how you're going to try to feed. And, and honestly, when the kidneys are damaged to the point that you're on dialysis, you know, you're just hoping for stability. It's unlikely to be able to get enough improvement to, in the kidney function that you'll be able to get off dialysis. Many people we get before they go on dialysis are able to slow down progression and sometimes considerably. And there is some reversal with creatinine levels dropping, but you know, you have to get them early enough where there's still some kidney function left because the kidneys process the blood and remove the toxins from the body. When the kidney function is so limited, it's very difficult to do efficient detoxification. Um, and as far as, um, uh, what was your other uh, diagnosis? Liver failure. Oh yeah, liver failure. Um, yeah, depending on how bad the uh, dysfunction is, if they're bad enough, they're not even willing to do their transplant, that's probably fairly substantial. Uh, dysfunction. Again, the focus is going to be fine-tuning dietary issues. The body's pretty forgiving when it comes to liver function. We've seen pretty dramatic improvements um, with dietary change, but I don't know that you'd be able to jump into fasting. Uh, you may be able to do some intermittent fasting, but maybe some more limited steps that can be done. Those aren't the patients that you'll see generally populating in the Toronto Health Center. Usually our patients are the ones that still have enough function that they can have a dramatic short-term result and make us look good. Thanks very much, Dr. Goldhammer. And up next, we're going to bring in Ainsley. Hello, Ainsley. Hi, everyone. Morning. Ainsley from Trinidad. Doctor, although I'm doing my fast right now, am I allowed to drink saffron water? That's this, I'm talking about the saffron threads. That, well, we don't use um, any substances except pure water. And generally, that's pure distilled water during water only fasting. Um, oh. ever, anything you introduce in fasting can alter the fasting process, even 10 mils of carbohydrate, the lemon and lemon juice that people add can alter how the body adapts to the fasting process. So we want to be uh, careful that when water fasting is appropriate, when it's properly supervised and it's done effectively, it's done exclusively on water only. Now, in some cases you have to modify that. Not everybody is able to adapt to that effectively, but uh, we wouldn't be using any exogenous agents. Uh, in our experience with water only fasting. And now, you know, so we have 21,000 cases where we've done it this way. We don't have experience doing it in a different way. So that would be an experiment that would have to be done to see if, if, if it enhances or deteriorates from the process. So therefore, sh I should stop all my antioxidants as soon as I start my fast. My, when I say antioxidants... Oh, you definitely don't want to be supplementing during fasting. So do Strongly just contraindicated. Just Oh. Even, even medications, for example, that you might normally get away with can be very much problematic during fasting. There can be a great potentiation of pharmaceuticals, for example. You can burn holes in people's stomachs and create all kinds of problems. Uh, you do not, in our experience, there's no supplementation used during uh, fasting and no medications used during fasting with a couple of rare exceptions that I mentioned already. Thyroid replacement therapy, if it's monitored properly, can be continued during fasting. It may need to be continued during fasting at a reduced dosage. And finally, and finally, doctor, for me, when I do my fast, on my day, I break my fast and I wash my hair. I realize I have a little bit more hair shedding. Just a, yeah. mm. Well, you don't want to wash your hair on the day you break a fast because you're vulnerable to orthostatic hypotension. You may find yourself passing out, and that's, that's a problem. Uh, any hair shedding isn't going to be when you break the fast. It's going to be uh, about 30 days post-fasting or anytime there's rapid weight loss or pregnancy. 
And what happens is those pregnancy, rapid weight loss of any kind, including fasting, causes the hair follicles to mature. And so instead of falling out over time, they'll come out together. It, there shouldn't be any loss in uh, hair overall, but it, you know, it may cause a short-term shedding effect. And so people often report that about a month after rapid weight loss of any kind, and then the hair comes back and it's fine. There is a possibility if you have an unrelated condition, a thyroid related condition or something that may be affecting hair loss. There's other dermatological issues that can affect hair function. So that should be checked out by your doctor. But as far as uh, hair loss, it's a little bit too early right after a fast to be expecting that there would have been anything related to the fast. The fact you haven't been washing your hair though may mean you'll, it'll look like there's more hair coming out just because you're flushing it out all at the same time. Well, um, how soon can you go ahead and, and take a shower after fast? Well, it depends on how long the fast is. It takes half the length of the fast usually to recover from fasting. And most people, by the time they're on whole food, they're going to be able to begin to restore normal activity. So for example, let's say a, fa a patient fasts for three weeks, they would have two to three days of juice or a day of fasting for every seven to 10 days of fasting it would be a day of juice, a day of raw food for every seven to 10 days of fasting. So it might take them four or five or six days to get to where they're now eating some steamed and starchy vegetables. And then when their blood sugars are stable, they may then be able to go back to more normal activity, start exercising again, doing other things. But you don't want to recover so quickly that you end up with problems because a lot of the toxins that have been mobilized during fasting are actually eliminated during the initial days as you come off the fast. If you look at the urine in patients as they start coming off the fast, it's much more concentrated than it would have been during the fast because a lot of that stuff is now getting a chance to process and be eliminated. So right. fasting is important and that, that half the length of the fast recovery is important. Those need to be done properly. That's also why we like fasting people in a controlled setting much more than at home because people make so many mistakes, they just muck it up and then fasting gets a bad reputation and people get hurt. Too right. rapid recovery in feeding can lead to refeeding syndrome. It can alter your electrolyte balance. It can lead to cardiac arrest and death. So now generally that's more common on long fast, not necessarily a short fast. But, you know, I get calls every week from people that are in trouble because they've done a really poor job of either not resting during fast and got them dehydrated. They re-alimate uh, inappropriately. And so then they get into trouble there or they go to the emergency room because they're having symptoms and they don't recognize the effect of fasting. So they'll hyperhydrate them and put them into congestive heart failure, or create some other mess. So it's, if you're going to fast, do it every day for 16 hours safely. If you're going to do a longer fast, get the benefit of a history exam and lab from your local doctor working with one of the True North doctors or come to the True North Health Center or one of the other clinics that we're affiliated with and do it properly. It will be a life enhancing uh, epiphany experience. Patient satisfaction is very high with fasting. It's really remarkable. We had a, a person here do their PhD on fasting behavior in humans and they contacted 600 people that had fasted, many of which had been 10 years or more since they went through fasting. And they asked them, you know, what was your experience? What happened? Would you do it again? Were you satisfied? Would you refer others? Patient satisfaction was actually higher than what they had re registered for outpatient massage. You know, very high patient satisfaction. And it's weird because, you know, person would say, oh, would you, what happened? Oh, I had low back pain, headache, nausea, vomiting, skin rashes. Would you do it again? Oh, yes. Highly beneficial. Would you recommend others? Oh, absolutely. And so the, the person that was in charge of the studies, their supervisor said, oh, this is um, Stockholm syndrome. These people were so traumatized by fasting that they identified with their captors and thought it was a good experience because they experienced Stockholm syndrome, you know, like Patty Hearst with the, that whole thing. And so, and the students said, well, wait a second, these people had not been there for 10 years. And Stockholm syndrome degrades over time. They said, oh, well, maybe it was more severe than Stockholm syndrome. And it had some kind of permanent damage to their body and their mind. And of course, that's not at all what happened. It's just people got perceived benefit. Now, it's interesting. You think this was 25 years ago. You think, well, today, it, you know, people wouldn't say that. We just had a, a journal article rejected by a major journal. And the editor said that <clears throat> although the article was well-constructed and well-written, it represented uh, fasting people for two weeks to look at their body composition changes. He said it was the most egregious violation of human safety standards that he'd ever heard of in 25 years of editing a journal. Now, remember, this is a journal that's had studies like 
cutting the nerves to the kidneys as a way of treating high blood pressure. I mean, some really barbaric stuff. But fasting uh, for two weeks and monitoring body composition constituted the worst violation of human safety standards he had ever witnessed. Now, our director of research was thinking, oh my goodness, they think we're doing bad things. Of course, what I'm thinking is, oh wait, no, 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 you don't understand. Listen carefully what he said. We're the worst violation he's ever witnessed. That means we're number one. It's always good to be number one. I might mention that same article has since been accepted and is gonna be published. They'll be coming out later this next month uh, in another journal. Mm -hmm.